Good morning. So I'm workshopping a couple stories. Um, one, a biker gang came into our neighborhood. And I tell you, they will never be the same. I mean, they were all elementary school, but still. Um, the other one is that I was, I fell off a cliff. I mean, it was a two inch cliff, but still. That's, you know, it's not a very exciting story. I just rolled my ankle and broke it yesterday afternoon about 4.30. So <clears throat> if you're interested in knowing um, how to do that, I can tell you it's, it's pretty uh, common in my family. We like breaking things. So that's just me today. So anyways, I'm going to be down here this morning, maybe up there next week. We'll, we will see. Uh, how is everybody? Okay, first row, you're in the splash zone. So I hope you're... You, you can get my autograph a little later if you want. Um, I'm excited about today because we get to actually start a whole new series, and, and uh, it's going to be a good one. I'm very excited. Me and Sam, uh, Sam Young, we're going to be kind of taking turns a little bit. Uh, he's going to be kind of bringing a message. We're going to be doing one sermon where we're actually tag teaming. But this is, a, uh, I would say, a crucial topic that we're going to be studying and, and so I'm very excited uh, to uh, go through this with you. Uh, and hopefully, by the end of this, we'll have a much more, I would say, clearer image of what it looks like to really connect and reach the uh, coming generations. So let's start with prayer, and then we will, we will begin. Thank you so much, Heavenly Father, for bringing us together today. Thanks for uh, the opportunity to uh, speak to uh, share scripture with people and hopefully cast a vision that is bigger than all of us, Lord, one that, that will hopefully move us not just to consider with our mind, but to act, Lord, to move with our, with our love and compassion, Lord, that we can find ways to make deep and lasting connections with, with uh, people of all generations. Lord, we, we, we pray that you would help us to listen this morning. And I know for, for, for a lot of us, this is probably the first time we've slowed down all week. And so in this moment, whenever, whenever we do slow down and our body just kind of says rest, I pray that you would give us rest, but help us not to be so deep that we're not paying attention, because I think you have some things to say to us today. Lord, help us. Uh, we love you. We are thankful. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so we're talking about uh, younger generations today, the now generation. One thing I love about Johnson Street, and this is something that, that Shelly and I have always noticed, is uh, since, since we've been here, is first we were surprised at how old this congregation was. Uh, what is it, 120, almost 125 years old or more than that? Uh, you know, it, it's an old congregation, but what I love is that it's not an old congregation. It's not an old church. Some churches in our culture are, are old churches they 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 look old they feel old and I, what I mean by that is that well some ministers are more like hospice chaplains in their congregations you know what I'm saying because there's a lot of churches that are that are slowly dying and granted there's something, you know, I think very okay with the circle of life when it comes to churches. Some, some churches are born, some churches live and are really active, and then some churches die. In our culture today, there's a lot more churches that are dying. It's happening more and more. They, churches have very little energy to adapt, to do something that's uncomfortable, to do something different, to reach the culture around them it's happening more and more but what I love about this church family is that we're still going strong you know our leaders and our people have had a track record of acting on faith doing things that are bold rather than acting through fear and being afraid so in 1963 this particular location was somewhat uh, isolated on the edge of town how many of you remember what it looked like from this side over back in 1963? You do, Sam? Nice, okay, good. Um, I, from what I've heard, this was really, we were out there. And, and what the stories that I've heard is that there were several people 
uh, members of the Harrison Irving congregation who thought this was one of the worst ideas ever to actually move uh, to the edge of town from a high visibility, high traffic area right downtown at Harris and Irving. They thought the elders were making a huge mistake. But what happened, those of you who stayed, you started to see over the last 60 years just why God urged that group of people to move. Over the past 60 years, this university has grown up around us. It has expanded to really envelop us. In fact, this parking lot, from my understanding, uh, it's not ours over here. We are in a partnership with ASU. Now, we own the lights, <laughs> so we have something out of the deal, right? Um, but as far as the parking lot goes, we're in, a, we're in a partnership with ASU. And so they get to use it for softball and some of those things. We get to use it for our events. But we've got a great relationship with this university. Uh, we've got an elementary school that has just grown up. I don't know when it was, it was uh, built, but it's right next door. We have a middle school that has over 1,300 students. Yes, 1,300 plus students. If anyone from the school board is listening, we need another middle school. Okay, I'm done with that. 1,300 students, less than a quarter of a mile down the street. And however many teachers, God bless them. Right there next to them, yeah? There are lots of opportunities around us. In fact, we are knee-deep in the middle of a huge opportunity, one that we might miss if we're not paying attention. One thing that's, maybe it's irony, I don't know, but there's a lot of churches on campuses across the country, and usually they're called something like University Baptist, University Church of Christ, University this or that, and it, it's amazing how many of these churches have absolutely no students attending. And they're right on a campus. In fact, the University Church of Christ in Austin has been on a slow decline for the past several years. And honestly, they may have 80 people from what I understand. I'm not saying that's bad. They have a huge opportunity. But I am saying that, that somewhere down the line, things started to change. People stopped paying attention. They assumed that people would just come. Johnson Street demographics has, we have lots of different types of people here. 82% uh, of us are over the age of 30. Okay, so from between 30 and 104. 82% <laughs> of us fit that particular demographic. 11% are between the ages of 10 and 19. But what's interesting is that only 6% of this congregation is ages 20 to 29 years old. 6%. So we have 17% that are between the ages of 10 and 29. This series is going to focus on the next generation. But we really can't wait until they become the next generation to connect with them so what we need to do is we need to look at them as who they really are and that is the now generation in fact if we don't start considering our younger generations as the church of today then they won't even be here tomorrow a lot of times we just think oh yeah they'll be the church soon we just got to make sure you know we teach them now in school and in church and then one day they're just going to rise up it's happening less and less for the next few weeks we're going to be talking about why this 17 percent of our demographic matters right here and right now it matters for the future of our church but it also matters for the church's present we're going to be talking about millennials which are or gen y and from what I've gathered, the millennials and Gen Y are anybody born after 1982, I think up to 96. As a, there's a wide swath of that. So we have, we have some that are 40 years old. Millennials are 40. Welcome, millennials, right? 
Um, but we also have Gen Z, which is anyone born, I think, between 96 and 2011, maybe? 11, 12. And then we have Gen Alpha, which is coming up, if you're interested in that type of identifier. But when you look at the church, the statistics of church involvement um, in America, what you start seeing is specifically when it comes to those graduating from high school the stats say that at least half of all graduates will walk away from church many walking away from their faith so if you were looking at a picture like this or even a picture of all the the graduating classes of johnson street over the last several years just take half of those people and kind of gray them out as if they're not going to be coming back that's the statistics countrywide many of these people will decide that doing something other than church is more beneficial with their time now in the past we've hoped that these people will return you know to in-person attendance more and more are actually watching online believe it or not but but we hope that they'll come back but it's simply not happening now we do have some in their 30s that are coming back because they have families and they're starting to kind of trickle back in, but that's not happening in a wide swath of, of, uh, of stats. I mean, the ratio is woefully unbalanced. This is interesting. It's not that those people born after 92 are opposed to religion. They just don't find it interests them. They're not that interested. And then I ask, why? Why are they not that interested? Well, something I've said here, I said it several years ago, but it's something I really believe, and I'm going to say it again today. I think the reason a lot of people aren't coming back to church is because the faith that they see lived out at home is not the same as the faith they see lived out at church. The faith that they see you, you know, exert at the workplace, it's not the same faith they see whenever we come into these doors. What we're finding is that things have changed. The road ahead is uncharted in many ways. The landscape ahead of us looks almost nothing like the landscape behind us. And what we're doing as a whole to reach our younger community really just isn't working that well. And what's funny is that when we realize something isn't working, and I'm guilty of this, instead of adapting we stick to what's comfortable for us and we just do it harder it's not working oh well let's just do it harder <laughs> and then it'll just work less and less i think what i'd like us to do is re-examine our intentions what are we as followers of jesus as a community of faith really trying to do we know the Great Commission requires us, teaches us, encourages us, moves us, however you want to say that. It, it tells us we need to go into the world, make disciples, baptize them, teach them to obey all the commandments. It doesn't tell us to sit and wait for the world to come to us. It doesn't tell us to sit and wait for the world to adapt to us. So if this is our mission, to make disciples, then we have to do our best to try to understand the people we're trying to reach across the generations. We can't assume they're going to just respond to the approach that we've always done, to the things we've done for prior generations. Because there are differences. There are differences between the generations all up and down the yearly spectrum, right? There's so many differences. For example, when you see this symbol, what do you normally think of? Hang on, let me... Let me what do you see, okay? Tic-tac-toe, a pound sign, or a... There you go, okay. How many of you see a hashtag? Raise your hand. How many of you see a pound sign? How many of you see a tic-tac-toe board? Probably all of us. <laughs> Okay, this is interesting because there are differences. Um, for example, how many of you have seen and know what these are? 
okay? How many of you do not know what those are? I've never seen them before. Cameron, really? Wow. Okay. So green stamps were things you used to collect when you would go to stores and you'd have booklets of them and you could use them to redeem for certain items. How many of you still have things you've redeemed from green stamps? Okay. Three. Nice. They used to make things of quality, you know? So it's kind of cool. You like collect green stamps and you just go, it's like money in a way. All right. How many of you uh, know what this is? Okay, have you heard this sound before? Everybody listen. Just lean into it. Ah. Doesn't that sound great? And then right after you hear a... You've got mail, right? (laughs) It was the best. I've got mail. In fact, I had that whenever I was in my computer class. I had, uh, it was a Tandy laptop. The screen was this wide, this long, and I used a a phone to hook into some little rubber cups, and then I could talk to each other, um, to other people in the same room as me. It was pretty exciting. (laughs) I mean, high, high tech stuff right there. But what's funny is that things are shifting, and, and it's always been this way. I think now, though, and I don't, maybe, it's, maybe it's no different now than it has been, but there are so many ideas and changes happening all at once. Just like, you know, right in these past 10, 20 years, just so many changes, and they're still coming. The New Testament... Paul's culture was changing. So talk about different people with different worldviews and different ideas and ways of seeing God and the spirits and different things. I mean, so many ideas. Paul had this issue. He was entering into a culture where there were so many different people and worldviews. How is he going to make a connection with people? This is why what you hear Paul saying a lot is, you know, don't demand your way. Just give up your preferences so that you can make some great connections. You don't have to, you know, always have your rights upheld. If, if you're going to make a connection with someone, you're going to have to give something up. And if you could go back to that prior um, scripture, this is what it says right here. It says, though I am free and belong to no one, I have made myself a slave to everyone to win as many as possible. He says, to the Jews I became like a Jew to win the Jews. To those under the law I became like one under the law, though I myself am not under the law, so as to win those under the law. To those not having the law I became like one not having the law, though I am not free from God's law, but I'm under Christ's law, which is the law of love. So as to win those not having the law. To the weak I became weak, to win the week. He says, I have become all things to all people so that by all possible means, let me say that again, so that by all possible means, I might save some. I do all of this for the sake of the gospel that I may share in its blessings. In order to reach his culture for Christ Paul was willing to adapt to empathize to put himself and his preferences last for the sake of others he did this because he loved deeply do we love the world as God loved the world in Jesus he also approached his culture through relationship and I want you to remember this Jesus moved into the culture, not away from it. He didn't separate himself from everything and then start yelling for people to come over there to him. Jesus moved into the culture, not away from it. He chose to enter into it and change it from the inside. He called people to join something much bigger than their bank account, much bigger than their opinion, 
much bigger than their religious affiliation or even their national identity and you think it's all of that is extreme now do you know what it was like in the days of jesus talk about extreme everything he called young adults is if you think about who the apostles were we a lot of times see you know movies and they look older these guys were young some of them they even suspect could have been 15 16 years old these are young adults jesus is calling and he called them into a life of purpose service and above all love are we calling the younger generation into this type of life Is this the kind of life they see when they walk through our doors? Is it the kind of life they see when they walk through your door at work or at at your home? Even though the now generation seems to be walking away from faith, they aren't walking away from goodness, though. They're not walking away from kindness, and they're not walking away from service. Here's some statistics. I'm going to read these quickly, and I think that they are helpful. A third of the world's population is Gen Y millennials making it the largest generation in history 87 percent think the environment is their responsibility they're green 81 percent have volunteered in the past year did you hear that 81 percent have volunteered in the past year 79 percent want to work for a company that cares about how it affects or contributes to society 77 percent said helping others was among their chief motivations in life chief motivations in life 61 percent feel personally responsible for making a difference in this world 60 percent get this 60 percent voted in the 2012 u.s presidential election in the 16 it was about 65 percent in the 20 it was a little bit higher i know some of you have made jokes and you make jokes millennials uh, are aimless telling you they're going to change the world they're not blithely walking through life waiting for something to happen these people are ready to change the world so there's hope so for the next few weeks issues that matter to these generations and how we might be able to speak into that We're going to be talking about uh, authenticity. I'm telling you, authenticity is going to be the hub through which the coming decade is um, we're able to reach people. If we're not genuine, if we're not real, no one's going to care anymore about what we do or what we say in this place. And we have everything to be real about. We're sinners saved by grace, right? God has saved us from, from a horrible fate. God has saved us into a life of love and joy and hope and peace regardless of our circumstances we have everything to be genuine about taking the message of jesus seriously we're going to be talking about that what does that look like to take the message of jesus seriously what does it look like to to have meaningful relationships and not just casual here and there's right meaningful relationships why they matter and we're going to be talking about cultural discernment how can we help each other navigate a changing world through the lens of God's transforming love and then we're going to move into this September conversation about mission and vision because there are people who may not be at church or think that that church has a lot to offer them but they're going to organizations that will provide purpose and mission organizations that that are bigger than they are we've got this god has called us into changing the world through love there is no greater vision or purpose than that we're going to be talking through these things when we get serious about connecting with the now generation we're going to experience not only new energy new relationships but we're going to be experiencing and finding new allies in the kingdom of God. And we don't have to be a mega church with a fog machine. We don't have to do that. But we do have to be real. We do have to pay attention. We have to care deeply, not just expect 
our elders, or our staff to make the connections. If we want to engage the now generation, all we need to do is just shift our focus. Be authentic. Be kind. Compassionate. Say hello and mean it. Not just here, wherever you are. Each and every day. In person and be kind, compassionate online. Just because someone says something you don't agree with doesn't mean you have to hammer them and let them know that they're wrong. Sometimes it just means you got to listen. I hear your point. Let's talk more. How about in person? What it does is it means including young people. It means including our now generation uh, in the things that we do. It shows them the way of Jesus um, personally, by the way you live your life, by the things you say. Paul did this with a young adult named Timothy. And what I loved about that whole relationship is he actually encouraged Timothy to do the same. He gave Timothy not only instruction, but responsibility, which is, which is pretty amazing. Even though he hadn't probably gotten to be that age where he was considered someone worthy of responsibility or respect. But this is what he told him. He says, you then, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things you have heard me say in the presence of many witnesses, he says, you entrust to reliable people who will also be qualified to teach others. He's saying, hey, here's your responsibility. Okay? As you've seen me do, now you go and do and teach others to do the same. Talk about trust. You know, he gave, he gave Timothy some keys of leadership there. And they weren't on a short lease. He freely gave them to him. And look what Timothy did. See, we have a unique opportunity here. We're positioned, oh man, we're positioned to reach the coming generations. And when the opportunity comes, let's pay attention. Let's know when to listen. Let's know when to speak. Let's lean in. Let's trust. Let's encourage. And let's listen because their thoughts are vital to the present and to the future of what we hope to do here in San Angelo. Because the mission is the same. God wants to show this world how deeply he loves them. And he wants to use you to do that. My question is, will we let him? Are we willing to give something up in order to reach people for the sake of the gospel? This is what we're going to be talking about. And I hope today you've been challenged to think about where you fit into this. And if, and if you haven't really paid attention, now's the time to start. Right? Every passing moment is another chance to turn it all around. Because the fields are ripe. God's good. And He loves this church. So I'm excited for what's what, what's coming what he wants to do here and I'm excited for the relationships and the connections that are hopefully going to be made over the next however many years he allows us to serve let's uh, pray together Heavenly Father thank you so much for the day and I pray that you would help us to be your people if we haven't paid attention help us to pay attention Lord if we haven't been real help us to own up to that if we've tried to play church if we've tried to pretend Lord we ask your forgiveness every morning we come in here every Sunday morning we come in here and I don't really know if we understand the power the power we're invoking through these prayers I pray that you would help us not to leave uh, the same but to leave changed more focused more purposeful You've got so much left for us. So many people to reach. So much joy to share. So much love to give. Help us to be faithful to that and to trust you even when we may not necessarily be comfortable. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. If you need prayer, we have men and women around the room. We would love to pray with you. Uh, let's all stand together as we sing. The power of hell forever defeated now it is well, I'm walking in freedom for God's
so loved, God so loved the world. Bring all your failures, bring your addictions, come lay them down at the foot of the cross. Jesus is waiting, God so loved.